whether by caravan through the Sahara or Gobi Desert, or by junk or dhow on the China Sea or Indian Ocean, goods, people, and ideas traveled with relative freedom through the networks of exchange in Afro-Eurasia in the years between 1200 and 1450. One reason for this free exchange was the stability of the Mongol Empire and the protection it offered merchants and travelers. The empire reached well past former boundaries, incorporating new people, goods, and ideas within its authority. Technological developments such as gunpowder and paper from China were diffused by trade. Literary and artistic interactions and cultural exchanges were documented by travelers such as Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta, who told of the wonders they saw and the extraordinary people they met. The known world became a larger place. The diffusion of different religions between 1200 and 1450 had varying effects. In some cases, the arrival of a new religion served to unify people and provide justification for a kingdom's leadership. It often also influenced the literary and artistic culture of the areas to which it spread, where themes, subjects, and styles were inspired by the spreading religion. In other places, it either fused or coexisted with native religions. The interactions resulting from increased trade also led to technological innovations that helped shape this period. Buddhism came to China from its birthplace in India via the Silk Roads, and the 7th century Buddhist monk Su An Singh helped make it popular. Monks related Buddhism to familiar Taoist principles, and in time, Buddhist doctrine fused with elements of Taoist traditions to create a syncretic faith known as Chan Buddhism or Zen Buddhism. Although some leaders in China did not want China's native religions diminished as a result of the spread of Buddhism, Zen Buddhism remained popular among ordinary Chinese citizens. Under the Song Dynasty, many Confucians among the scholar gentry began to adopt its ideals into their daily lives. The development of printing had made Buddhist scriptures widely available to the Confucian scholar gentry. Buddhist writers also influenced Chinese literature by writing in the vernacular language rather than the formal language of Confucian scholars, a practice that had become widespread. Countries in China's orbit also adopted Buddhism along with Confucianism. In Korea, the educated elite studied Confucian classics, while Buddhist doctrine attracted the peasants. Neo-Confucianism was another syncretic faith that originated in China, first appearing in the Tang Dynasty but developing further in the Song Dynasty. Neo-Confucianism fused rational thought with the abstract ideas of Taoism and Buddhism and became widespread in Japan and Vietnam. It also became Korea's official state ideology. All the world's religions can be found in this region. As you can see, um, some are more strong than others, but of course they have spread. Today, this area right here, the world, Indonesia, has the world's largest population of Muslims. So of course we see Islam spread rapidly there. And then we see a melding of different traditions throughout this region where it's not just one religion being celebrated or you know, um, followed, like for instance, Shintoism in Japan is what we call a companion religion. It's meant to go with another one. Typically in Japan, it either goes with Christianity or Buddhism. So anyways, as one can see, very, very diversified in terms of religion. Through trade, the Indian religions of Hinduism and Buddhism made their way to Southeast Asia as well. The sea-based Sivajaya Empire on Sumatra was a Hindu kingdom, while the later Majapahit kingdom on Java was Buddhist. The South Asian land-based Sinhala dynasties in Sri Lanka became centers of Buddhist study with many monasteries. Buddhism influence was so strong under the Sinhala dynasties that Buddhist priests often advised monarchs on matters of government. 
The Khmer Empire in present-day Cambodia, also known as the Angkor Kingdom, was the most successful kingdom in Southeast Asia. The royal monuments at Angkor Thom are evidence of both Hindu and Buddhist cultural influences on Southeast Asia. Hindu artwork and sculptures of Hindu gods adorned the city. Later, when Khmer rulers had become Buddhist, they added Buddhist scriptures and artwork onto the buildings while keeping the Hindu artwork. Through merchants, missionaries, and conquests, Islam spread over a wide area of Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. The chart on the next slide summarizes some of the cultural influences of that expansion. In Africa, some of these cultural influences, for example, is the Swahili language, which is a blend of Bantu and Arabic and is still widely spoken today. Tenbuktu became a center of Islamic learning and leaders in African states deepened Islamic ties through pilgrimages to Mecca. South Asia before Islam, Hinduism and Buddhism were popular. After Islam, Buddhists converted more than Hindus. Islam attracted lower caste Hindus because of the emphasis on equality. Then you see an architectural blend between the two. And in Southeast Asia, Muslim rulers on Java combined Mughal Indian features, local traditions, and Chinese Buddhist and Confucian traits. Traditional Javanese stories, puppetry, and poetry absorbed Muslim characters and techniques. Along with religion, science and technology traveled the trade routes. Islamic scholars translated Greek literary classics into Arabic, saving the works of Aristotle and other Greek thinkers from oblivion. Scholars also brought back mathematic texts from India and techniques for paper making from China. They studied medicine from ancient Greeks, Mesopotamians, and Egyptians, making advances in hospital care, including surgery. Improvements in agricultural efficiency, such as the use of champa rice, spread from India to Vietnam and China. With a reliable food supply, the population grew, as did cities and industries, such as the production of porcelain, silk, steel, and iron. Paper making reached Europe from China in the 13th century, and along with printing technology, helped lead to a rise in literacy. Seafaring technology improved with the lantine sails, the stern rudder, the astrolabe, and the magnetic compass as Chinese, Indian, and Southwest Asians expanded their knowledge of astronomy and other aspects of the natural world. Production of gunpowder and guns spread from China and influenced warfare as well. Thanks in part to the writing of Marco Polo, historians have a good picture of the city of Hangzhou in China. It shows how trade supported urbanization. Hangzhou was large. It was home to about 1 million people, but other Chinese cities were larger. Chang'an had about 2 million people. However, Hangzhou was the center of culture in southern China, the home of poets and writers and artists. Located at the southern end of the Grand Canal, it was also a center of trade. Like other important cities of the area, such as Novgorod in Russia, Timbuktu in Africa, and Calicut in India, the city grew and prospered as its merchants exchanged goods. This trade brought diversity to Hangzhou, including a thriving community of Arabs. Other cities on the trade routes that grew and thrived, including Sumerkand and Kashgar, they were both known as centers of Islamic scholarship, bustling markets and sources for fresh water and plentiful food for merchants traveling along the Silk Road. Kashgar, however, declined after a series of conquests by nomadic invaders and in 1390 was ravaged by Tamerlane. Another once thriving city, the heavily walled Constantinople in present day Turkey, also suffered a series of traumatic setbacks. Mutinous Crusader armies weakened Constantinople after an attack in the Fourth Crusade in 1204. And in 1346 and 1349, the bubonic plague killed about half of the people in Constantinople. 
After a 53-day siege, the city finally fell to the Ottomans in 1453, an event some historians believe marks the end of the High Middle Ages. Many factors led to the uh, growth of cities. Of course, one of the things was political stability. It led to a decline in invasions. You also had stronger governments who provided more protection, like right here is a walled city. Um, the Mongols will make sure walled cities no longer are effective, but still, you also had safe and reliable transportation, rise of commerce, um, the use of money becomes more standardized, plentiful labor supply, and everybody's able to kind of focus on one thing. They call it diversification of labor. And there was an increased agricultural output, which again led to a larger population. But as these cities did grow in wealth, that did lead to another confrontation between settlers and nomads. And we have a lot of Turkish tribes that are going to leave northern Asia and ride down into some of these uh, major cities and conquer them, like the Ottoman Turks um, from Mongolia will conquer Constantinople. Still, um, the Turks are there today. Disease is also rampant, you know, along these routes, and there is a decline for a time in agricultural productivity. Knowledge of the world beyond Western Europe increased as Crusaders encountered both the Byzantine and Islamic cultures. The encounters also increased demand in Europe for newfound wares from the East. In opening up to global trade, however, Western Europeans also opened themselves up to disease. The plague, referred to as the Black Death, because of the pustles that broke out on people would turn black and then fall off, and that's how you knew you had the plague. This was introduced to Europe by way of trading routes. A major epidemic broke out between 1347 and 1351. Additional outbreaks occurred over the succeeding decades. As many as 25 million people in Europe may have died from the plague. With a drastically reduced population, economic activity declined in Europe. In particular, a shortage of people to work on the land had lasting effects on the feudal system. Also, exposure to new ideas from the Muslim world would contribute to the Renaissance and the subsequent rise of secularism. This is a primary source of painting uh, by a famous artist, Peter Bruegel the Elder, on the Black Plague. And so it kind of serves as our source of what it was like at that time. And you just can take a moment to look at the utter chaos and, and how, in this instance, the Black Plague really didn't care if you were a priest over here, you could get it. If you were a king, here's one's lane right here. Peasant, soldier, didn't matter your class, didn't matter anything. It was a great equalizer um, this time period. As exchange networks intensified and literacy spread as a result of paper and printing technology, an increasing number of travelers within Afro-Eurasia wrote about their journeys for eager readers. In the 13th century, Marco Polo, an Italian native from Venice, visited the court of Kubla Khan. Chinese cities impressed Polo. After Polo returned to Italy in 1295, he wrote a book about his travels. However, many Europeans refused to believe his descriptions of China's size, wealth, and wonders. Only when other Europeans followed Polo's route to China did people widely accept that China was prosperous and innovative. Polo's captivating descriptions of the customs of people he met intrigued Europeans. Polo wrote extensively about the high levels of urbanization he saw in the 13th century. He was just 21 years old. Ibn Battuta, a Muslim scholar from Morocco, set out to see the world he had read about. He wrote this, I set out alone, having neither fellow traveler in whose companionship I might find cheer nor caravan whose part I might join, but swayed by an overmastering impulse. Over 30 years, I've been Batuta traveled through Central Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, China, Spain, North Africa, and Mali, mainly to Muslim lands. 
After his telling his tales to the Sultan of Morocco, Batuta was told to dictate an account of the cities which he had seen in his travels and of the interesting events which had clung to his memory, and that he should speak of those to whom he had met, of the rulers of the country, of their distinguished men of learning, and of their pious saints. His book, A Gift to Those Who Contemplate the Wonders of Cities and the Marvels of Traveling, provides a wealth of detail about the places he visited and their cultures. Unlike Polo, Batuta had a point of view of the Muslim devoted to his faith. His journey was in large part to learn as much as he could about Islam and its people and accomplishments. English mystic Marjorie Kemp, whose The Book of Marjorie Kemp was one of the earliest autobiographies in English, if not the first, could neither read nor write. She dictated her book to scribes who wrote down her descriptions of her pilgrimages to Jerusalem, Rome, Germany, and Spain. She does relate details of her travel experiences, such as being overcome by the sight of Jerusalem as she approached it and that she nearly fell off her donkey. However, her book is also significant because it is a first-hand account of a middle-class medieval woman's life. Kemp conveys both the intense spiritual visions and feelings of her mystical experiences and the trials of everyday life for a woman with 14 children. Whether by land or by sea, this was a time period of great cultural diffusion. The empire now secured trade routes and allowed for ideas to spread like gunpowder and printmaking. As a result, literacy rates rose and populations grew. But there was a downside in that disease also grew along with populations. And then warfare was a result of this new wealth found in cities. Technological developments also helped were and also helped increase trade. Uh, literary and artistic interactions and cultural exchanges were documented by people like Marco Polo, Marjorie Kemp, and Iben Batuta. The world now was a much larger place.